Uh, so we found also that a number of patients who have intestinal dysmotility and gastroparesis, uh, they do have chronic infections and autoimmune component. Chronic diarrhea, myalgia, uh, recurrent urtic area, which may be also classified as part of uh, mast cell activation <coughs> syndrome. Crawling sensation, when people feel like something crawls under their skin, is very sensitive. Palpitations and PAT syndrome. So majority of patients with PAT syndrome do have underlying infection, so it, it, you just need to do an appropriate workup to figure out what it is. So what do we see uh, as a part of physical findings? So after stomatitis all the time, active synovitis uh, of medium and large joints, more than small joints. So uh, because in our practice we're using ultrasound a lot, so we defined uh, tina synovial cysts under, uh, well, in specific joints, and it's, in my hands at least, it's very unique and very diagnostic tool uh, indicated of chronic infections. Uh, then we're using thermography in our clinic a lot, and so uh, once you start using it, you can recognize specific thermographic patterns which are indicative uh, for uh, various infectious processes. Uh, cervical, brachial, and inguinal lymphadenopathy, definitely. And then uh, specific dermatological findings, uh, which also indicative for chronic infection. So I'll show you a couple of pictures from our practice. So for example, uh, this is a uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound of the knee, a part of the knee. So what you can see, uh, this is pa distal patellar tendon. And so uh, uh, this is uh, tibia, tibial plateau. And this is the cyst. So once you see the cyst, you know that you're dealing with uh, most likely, again, it's not 100%, but most likely you're dealing with chronic infectious process and you need to do an appropriate workup to define exactly what's the underlying problem. So that's another example. So uh, another area where we see uh, cyst formation all the time, it's a uh, uh, bicipital tendon. So it's basically a long head of the biceps tendon. So this is bicipital groove and uh, this is a normal looking tendon and you can see a cyst right there. So with uh, some degree of tenosynovitis by color Doppler. So once you see this lesion, you need to think about, okay, what I'm missing, what kind of infectious process can be underlying that cyst formation. So I want to show you some thermographic images from our clinic as well. So uh, different infections can give you different profiles on thermography. So this is a patient with chronic Bartonella infection. And so she was diagnosed with Bartonella even before we confirmed her diagnosis with serology. So how do we know? So basically patients with Bartonella, they're prone to so-called spider profile. Uh, and so uh, why? Well, because Bartonella induces uh, proliferation of small blood vessels under the skin. And you, can, you don't see them when you examine these patients, but you can clearly see under uh, thermography. Uh, somehow the quality of the image is not great, but again, if you do different resolution, you can see it very clearly. And so, <clears throat> uh, and then we came up with a uh, lab criteria which we're using all the time. So what are the major criteria? So uh, changes in specific uh, complement components. So first of all, uh, it's elevation of C4A. Uh, so it's been shown in many, many publications that uh, C4A elevation reflects the activity of uh, an underlying chronic infectious process. Uh, some people feel like uh, this is unique for uh, Lyme disease, and I can tell this is not unique for Lyme disease. Some people think that it's unique for chronic fungal infection. It is not. So it's a very, very uh, non-specific test, but it does reflect activity of underlying infectious process. Uh, and uh, frequently, C4A elevation uh, is associated with elevation of C4. Uh, so the next thing is low C3A, which is also not very specific for any particular infections, but again, in general, you can see low C3A in patients with chronic infections during exacerbation. And uh, increased C1Q binding activity, which is obvious because of formation of immune complexes. Uh, somehow, based on statistical analysis of uh, our patients, we came up uh, with the second criteria, which is the presence of IgM anti carilapin antibodies. Uh, don't ask me why. Uh, it's just basically based on pure statistics. So we found that uh, patients have chronic infections and in those in whom infection is active, uh, so they have elevated level of IgM anti carilapin antibodies. So uh, the next one came actually from Lyme area, but again, it's not specific for Lyme. You can see it in any patient with chronic infections. Uh, it's a low level of 
CD57 positive cells. Again, it's not specific for Lyme. It's specific just for active chronic infections. We see it in patients with Yersinia infection, patients with mycoplasma, Lyme disease, patients with strep infection. So what happened is CD57 and uh, uh, natural killer cells which uh, do migrate to the areas of uh, infectious. And so if you have forsyth infection in your system, so uh, uh, there is a migration process which takes place. And so because of that, uh, you can see the drop of CD57 cells in peripheral blood. And as you treat these patients, so uh, the CD57 goes up. And so it's a very useful marker to uh, follow up patients with chronic infections. And finally, finally, one of the major criteria is elevated level of antihistone antibodies. So, and again, a lot of uh, immunologists who are dealing with antihistone antibodies, uh, they consider antihistone antibodies as markers of uh, immune complexes. So what are the minor criteria? So obviously, uh, elevated uh, levels of high sensitivity CRP, plain CRP, acidrate, hyper IgG, IgM, or IgA. Uh, elevated levels of uh, gamma interferon can be seen in a number of patients with reactivated viral illnesses, uh, elevated WBC and neutrophil count in particular. So elevated level of uh, ACE uh, is seen mainly in patients with uh, uh, various infections affecting lungs. So procalcitonin is a unique marker. So uh, it was described uh, in France around 20 years ago as a marker of sepsis and it's unique for septic conditions, so, but you can see elevation of procalcitonin uh, in patients uh, with uh, acute exacerbation of chronic illnesses, and especially when you start treating patients with antibiotics and you're dealing with die off of Herxheimer reactions, so procalcitonin goes up. Uh, also, <coughs> uh, we're talking about a bit more exotic tests, but elevated level uh, of beta-2 microglobulin, which reflects actually a lymphocyte activation, and uh, a serum and urine level of neopterion. So all these minor criteria can be put together to characterize patients if you're not sure whether you're dealing with acute uh, phase or more or less kind of dormant phase of the illness. So, and I think this is my final slide for the first portion. So uh, these are uh, infections which frequently associate with autoimmune diseases. And so we're talking about a couple of Yersinia species, mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, chlamydia trachomatis, strep, borrelia, Klebsiella, Campylobacter, Bartonella, Babesia, Anaplasma, and so on and so on, uh, including Helicobacter pylori and Pseudomonas, so, and obviously atypical mycobacteria, and these are the viruses. Again, the list can be probably double or triple based on our current knowledge. So, questions? Please. <coughs> We're just going to switch to part two, and let's take some questions from the first part of the conversation at the school. So, we would like to move the room at the back for this question. Hi, uh, what are the L forms of the infected community that we're talking about? So, uh, L forms are forms uh, which are depleted of cell wall. So, it's a cell wall free forms. <coughs> so, uh, these are the forms which produce. For example, if you're talking about Streptococcus group A and Dr. Cunningham can basically give you more details about chemistry of those forms, but so, uh, for example, in case of uh, group A strep, L forms don't have cell wall. So they have the membrane, but not cell wall. So uh, L forms can produce all the toxins like streptolysin or they can produce DNAs, B, and so on and so on, but they don't assemble cell wall. So, uh, and by definition, typically, uh, they have very low potential of inducing like rheumatic fever, right? So uh, cell wall uh, free forms like L forms, they are resistant to penicillin uh, because they don't assemble cell walls, right? So they can survive in patients who are treated with penicillin. But if you stop penicillin, they can reassemble cell wall and become pathogenic again. Front of the room on the left is our next question. Are there uh, performance differences between like laboratory performance things like uh, C4A, C57? Yes, and yes, there are. Absolutely. Is there any advice? Uh, we're using different labs for different reasons. So uh, I would say, strangely enough, uh, C4A, we're using mainly Quest because uh, LabCorp didn't do any good job for us. So CD57, LabCorp is doing a better job than Quest. Uh, but again, uh, the same is true for serology. So uh, a couple of years ago, we did split sampling with sending our uh, samples to lab corp and quest specifically for Lyme serology. And we get zero patients who have positive serology from quest and 
probably half of the patients in whom were suspicious of Lyme disease came back positive from lab corp. So Quest is useless when you're using it for like Lyme serology. So there are differences. Uh, we like using Quest for mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, uh, because they give you numeric numbers. Uh, at lab corp, they give you yes, no. So, but it's, it's a long list, it depends. Do we have another one, or would you like to save this the end? We're ready to start the last two lottery. Let's move on to the second part. We're all ready. Right. So, 